Duolingo English test speaking mistake number one is that you say uh or um too much. This is very natural. Everybody says uh or um. I, I do it all the time. I'm sure I'm gonna hear in the comments, you said um like 20 times in this video. I know. For the Duolingo English test, you wanna try to avoid saying uh or um. Here's why. Part of the Duolingo English test grading criteria is how much you can say in a limited amount of time and your pronunciation and pace of speech. If you say uh or um too much, it's gonna hurt how much you can say in a, in a limited amount of time. So how do you fix this problem? Three ways. The first way is to plan your introduction. So you can have an idea of what you're gonna say when you see a picture like speak about the photo. What is, what's the first thing you're gonna say? So instead of saying, ah, uh, this is um, a picture of a woman and uh, instead of that, you can know that I'm, I'm gonna start every time I see an image, this is a picture of, or in this image, or the first thing I notice is. You can use this beginning for any speak about the photo question. And it's better than saying, uh, this is um, a picture of uh, like a woman and uh, she's like, uh, doesn't sound so great. That's one way to avoid vocal fillers, like uh or um. Second way to avoid vocal fillers is to memorize some transition words. So, for example, you'll notice that I say that a lot in these videos. So, for example, that's a transition word. That's a transition phrase, right? This is a list, a table of a lot of different transition words for different purposes. I'm just going to give a quick example of how you can use transition words for adding information. So words like also, actually, additionally, as well. These will help you add information. And if you know these transition words, you can use them instead of saying uh or um. So here in this example, I would say something like, in my opinion, a great teacher must be kind and patient. So instead of saying, uh, a great teacher um, is kind and patient. I could say, well, in my opinion, and I'm thinking while I'm saying that because these transition words are like automatic. I don't have to think about them. So that's another way to avoid vocal fillers. The third way is to record, review, count. This is how you practice at home. If you practice a speaking response, you record your voice and then you listen back to it and you count how many uhs or ums you have. If you have, let's say 10, you're gonna do it the same response again, and you're gonna try to have less this time, maybe eight this time instead of 10. You're always gonna have these vocal fillers, they're natural, but you wanna try to reduce them if you're saying them too much. So that's mistake number one. Might be a bit surprised by that. I think you're gonna be surprised also by these next six mistakes. So make sure you stick around to the end to make sure you don't make these mistakes on, te on test day because they can cost you points, right? Right, <laughs> so here we go. Mistake number two is, of course I'm a teacher, so I'm gonna tell you to get feedback from a teacher. And I think the best way to do that is to get a production score evaluation from tstprep.com. This is where you meet with a teacher for 30 minutes. They check your speaking, they check your writing, and it's a great way to know your strengths and weaknesses to get a kind of quick evaluation so you know what to practice at home. So definitely check that out. Get feedback from a teacher who knows about the test and knows what the graders are looking for. Let's go to mistake number three. This is a big one that I see a lot of students make is that your response sounds like a grocery list. <laughs> now, what does that mean? It means that it doesn't sound like a story. It doesn't sound like a, uh, a response where you develop the topic. So here, let's look at this question where it says, talk about a gift you gave to a loved one. And they ask you a series of questions after that. If you just answer the questions like, I recently gave my five-year-old son a gift. I gave him a Nintendo Switch. My son was happy, so he felt good. I gave my son a switch because he said the, that he wanted to play with his friends online. This is not a great response because you're just kind of listing out answers. You need to tell a story. 
you want to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So th that way you develop the topic, you show a wide range of vocabulary and a wide range of grammar. Let's look at how this question should look, uh, this answer should look. I'm going to just read this. This is only a part of the response. I've given a bunch of gifts over the years, but the one that stands out in my mind is the Nintendo Switch I bought for my five-year-old son for Christmas last year. That's my introduction. Not only did I buy him a Switch, but I also bought him a few extra remotes so he can play with his sister and his friends. I even picked up a handful of games like Mario Party and Animal Crossing. I'll never forget the smile of his, on his face when he tore open the wrapping paper. Okay, and I keep going. I answer these questions while I'm telling the story. You want to try to do the same for your response. Don't make it like a list. This is also hard to do for speak about the photo because, you know, it's hard to tell the story about a photo that doesn't involve you, right? You're, you are not in this picture. How are you going to tell a story when you're not in this picture? Right, so let me show you how that would work. Uh, if you just list it out, like this is a picture of a woman, she's holding something in her hands. This response is too short, it's not that interesting, it's kind of hard to, set, to have a wide vocabulary and grammar when you do this. So let me show you what this would look like. You want to tell a story through what you notice, your interaction with this picture. The first thing I notice is a young pharmacist looking down and concentrating on some kind of metal tray. She's wearing a white lab coat. Okay, so I'm talking about the first thing I notice and then what she's wearing and the things that I see. I talk about the environment. Next to her is an empty pill bottle and a large white bag labeled cotton balls. And then I talk about the background. And then I say, this must be a pharmacy. And now I'm making guesses about this. So you see how this is more like a story instead of just like a list of things. I'm saying, okay, my, this is my first reaction, first thing I notice. I notice she's wearing something. Now I'm going to move on to the background. What do I see around her? Okay, now I'm going to move on to what I think is going on. That's the kind of story you want to say so it doesn't sound like a list. All right, so that's the third mistake I think we're up to. Yeah, third mistake. Okay, so avoid the grocery list. Let's go to mistake number four. You speak like a robot. Don't do that. <laughs> I, now, the reason for this is because uh, you're taking a test, you're nervous, they ask you a question, you don't really care about this question. You just know you have to answer it for this test. So your response is very like tight and robotic. So I'll give you an example of what this would look like. I have given a bunch of gifts over the years, but the one that stands out in my mind is the gift I gave to my son for Christmas last year. Not only did I buy him a Switch, but I also bought him extra remotes so he can play with his sister and friends. So I don't have any emotion, any feeling. I don't really go up or down. You can hear the difference when I'm speaking to you right now. I want you to listen. So I'm trying to go up and down. There's a music to my voice. Uh, you want to have that same emotion when you're speaking. A good way to do that is that, you know, you can't move around so much when you're taking the test, but you'll notice that I'm moving my hands a lot when I'm speaking. You want to try to do that because when you're kind of tight and rigid, your speech will be tight and rigid. Try to relax, back straight, chest out, and you move your hands a little bit. Totally fine. Mistake number five, which is that you follow the directions. I talked about this in the video about writing mistakes. Same thing for the speaking. It says, for example, for speak about the photo, speak for at least 30 seconds about the image or for read then speak. Speak your answer to the question below. You have 30 to 90 seconds. So you want to speak for as long as possible. The direction should say, speak as long as possible <laughs> while staying on topic. Speak long as possible while staying on topic. Now the reason for this is because it's part of your grade. The grading criteria uh, for the Duolingo English test is your lexical variety, your grammatical variety, how much grammar and vocabulary you show. The longer your answer, the more vocabulary and grammar you can show. So 
when I first took the test, I just spoke for 30 seconds and finished because I wanted it to be over. Uh, try not to do that. Try to speak for as long as possible. Usually I recommend speaking for at least 60 seconds. You don't have to speak for the whole 90 seconds, uh, but I would recommend at least 60 seconds. Definitely not less than 45 seconds if you want a score of 120 or higher on your production score. The more you speak and write, the better your score in general, okay? So keep that in mind. But you have to stay on topic. You don't want to ramble. But yeah, if you could stay on topic, do it. Try to expand your answer. And if you want to know more about that, check out my course on the Duolingo English Test at tscprep.com. All right, let's go to the sixth mistake. We got two more mistakes. Here we go. Mistake number six is that uh, you speak without confidence. This is similar to what I was just talking about before, that you speak like a robot. Uh, also speaking without confidence. Again, this is natural. English is not your first language. You're nervous about this test, but you want to try to sound confident. Now, I got a couple little tricks to help you do that. You want to do that with your body. You want to use your body to help you sound more confident. So, you know, you don't have to actually be more confident. You could just do a couple little things with your body and that'll help you get more confident automatically. What are these three things? Well, first thing is pretty simple. Keep your back straight. Kind of have to do this for the test anyway, because you have to keep your face in the camera the whole time. But you don't want to set up the camera and just be like this, right? You don't want to be leaning back when you set up the camera. You want to try to have a good posture throughout the whole test. So keep that in mind because when you have your back straight and your chest out, you project more confidence. When you're slouched and you're down, you're less confident. Uh, this is kind of comfortable. I wanna, <laughs> I kind of wanna stay like this, but let, let me get back up. The second way to improve your confidence is to use your hands, just like I mentioned before. When you use your hands, you're more emotionally connected to what you're saying. If I gave my entire talk like this and just spoke like a newscaster without moving my hands, it's harder to do, it's harder to sound emotional, you sound stiffer. Use your hands, keep your back straight. Third way is to open your mouth. I know that's weird advice, uh, but let me explain, is that basically, uh, American English especially tends to come from our chest uh, we, and we project it out. Our mouths are a bit more open compared to other languages like Japanese where the, the sound comes mostly from the nose and the mouth is a little tighter like you know, like, like there's, a, there's a kind of tightness to it. But when I'm speaking English, you know, my mouth is wider and open, you know, so uh, you, you, when I'm speaking Japanese, I, I get a little tight. Uh, so you want to try to have a, an open mouth if that's possible, if that feels comfortable for you, because your pronunciation is usually better and you sound more kind of Americanish a little bit. Uh, this might not be as much of an issue for people from Europe than from people from Asia, where Asian languages tend to have, uh, you don't need to use your mouth too much to express things. So you can have a kind of tighter mouth. I don't know if that makes sense. But anyway, yeah, you can open your mouth, make you feel a bit more confident. Last mistake, mistake number seven, is that you do not make inferences. This is a big one, so pay attention here. This is especially for speak about the photo questions. And uh, when you're speaking about a photo, it's kind of hard to speak for 90 seconds. I mean, what am I gonna say about this picture for 90 seconds? I mean, it's all pretty clear. There's a woman working in a pharmacy. She's wearing a white lab coat. There's pills behind her. You know, what else am I gonna say? Well, what you can do is that you can make guesses about what's going on or where she is. And here's an example. This must be a pharmacy, and she's one of the pharmacists in charge of filling orders. It looks like she's filling someone's prescription, preparing the pills, and getting ready to move them to the bottle. She must have gone to school for a long time to earn a degree where she could work at a job with so much responsibility. So not only am I guessing about what she's doing in the picture, but I'm also guessing about her past, you know, how she got this job in the first place. This must, and now I'm making a guess about the type of job. This must be a stressful job 
since a single mistake could cost someone their life. So these inferences are guesses about the person in the picture, about how this person's feeling, about the type of job they're doing. So that's a good way to show a wide vocabulary and grammar and also make your responses longer so you can fill that 90 seconds. All right, remember, go to tstprep.com, get a production score evaluation. There's a coupon code for a discount in the description below because that's really gonna help you know how to prepare at home, how to measure your strengths and weaknesses. So definitely meet with a teacher, 30 minutes, and then you'll know exactly what you need to do at home. And if you found this video helpful, I think you're ready to practice. So check out this video of the Duolingo English Test speaking practice where you can actually try out some of the questions and avoid these seven mistakes. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Oh, subscribe as always, please. Thank you, like, subscribe. Appreciate it so much. Thank you and I'll see you in the next one. All right, take care.